My name is Chris Collier. I'm the executive director of Renew Theatres, and we operate the Princeton Garden Theater, uh, the Highway Theater in Jenkintown, the Ambler Theater in Ambler, PA, and the County Theater in Doylestown. Um, so there are likely uh, those of you from any one of those theaters uh, joining us, and sometimes we actually have some uh, participants from outside of our network. So thank you to all. This is very fun to bring everyone together in these virtual platforms. I do actually recognize some faces. This is our third Film 101 seminar. And I recognize some of you who have been to previous ones and some who have been to all of them. Um, so it's really great to have you back. Um, just a couple ground rules, uh, not ground rules, but uh, policies and things to keep in mind. Uh, there are gonna be about 30 of us. And for Zoom decorum, we recommend that everyone stay on mute until you are ready to talk and then you can unmute to talk. What we'll do in terms of general policy is uh, we'll start by, if you have a question, uh, to just unmute and ask it. But if we find that people are talking over each other, we'll switch to either raising hands and I will call on whomever is uh, asking, or we can use to the, the comment thread and we'll just stay on mute and then I can call on people as they comment. Um, so far in our previous conversations, we've had no issues and uh, conversation has been super smooth. Um, so uh, that, that's just how we'll run things and we'll see how everything goes. Uh, this is obviously a four part seminar and this is the first of four of these conversations. We've got uh, four incredible movies lined up. I hope that you all enjoyed Gangs All Here. There's definitely a lot to talk about. Uh, the uh, additional seminars will be every three weeks as uh, shared in the email and on our website. And you should have all gotten the link today to the landing page on our site that has the Zoom links for all the other emails or for all the other um, events. I will try and send emails out before them to remind you, but that page, uh, princetongardentheater.org slash Latin numbers will always have those up there. So you can always go back to that to find these. I have found that, um, so our email account is hosted by Google, and I don't know if this is on purpose, but anytime I type Zoom into an email, Google flags it for spam. I think that they're trying to push people to use their platform. Um, so I, I have been either trying to hide the word Zoom and just say we're going on discussion or something along those lines. So if you do find uh, you, know, you need to look for an email or go back through things and it's not showing up in your inbox, please check your spam. Uh, it tends to vanish because of that, but we're trying to work around it as best as possible. Um, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce Professor Brian Herrera, who will be leading us on this journey over the next uh, couple weeks and through these four films. I'll just read a little bit of his bio. Um, Brian Herrera is the Associate Professor of Theater in the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University, where he's also a core faculty member in the program in Gender and Sexuality Studies and a faculty affiliate with the programs in American Studies, Music Theater, and Latino Studies. If you're interested in this topic further, you can actually pick up his book, uh, which also has the title Latin Numbers, and examines the way in which Latino actors in the 20th century stage and screen communicated and influenced American ideas about race and, race and ethnicity. And I'm sure that we're going to get a lot of interesting facts and uh, discussion out of these four films. So with that as the intro, I'd like to turn everything over to Brian, and thank you again for joining us. Yes, thank you. And thanks, thanks, uh, Chris, for that introduction, which is <clears throat> sort of a brief introduction to who I am and what I do. What I, what I, let me just, by way of introduction, I am a historian of US popular performance, um, by which I mean that to mean I am, I talk about uh, film, television, and theater, and I use it as a way to think, to chart, and to explore the ways our ideas about race, gender, and sexuality. Um, have changed and how popular performance, film, television, and theater can sort of give us a glimpse into what were the common sense ideas or the common sense questions or the still un uncertain realities that were going on in different past moments. And 
Uh, this, uh, my, one of my active areas of interest is the presence and absence of people we would today recognize as Latino, Latinx, or Hispanic, and the ways in which their presence in mainstream US popular performance uh, sort of charts its own kind of track and how, we, how uh, American culture at large came to understand those uh, individuals as part of a group that was adjacent to whiteness and adjacent to non-whiteness, but always a little bit uncertain where they fit in the broader sense of American uh, identity. And so uh, this series of films, um, it's a this series of discussions that I'm gonna be leading over the next uh, two months, uh, every three weeks, as Chris noted. Um, and you'll notice that in each of the films that I've highlighted tonight, it's The Gang's All Here, which is sort of a way to think about Carmen Miranda but then also uh, in a few weeks, West Side Story, a few weeks after that, Zoot Suit, and a few weeks after that, Selena. We're jumping in each of these films about two decades. And in, and, but we're also, if you know those films, you might recognize that all of them are films in which uh, musical performance figures as a prominent feature. I am, I am presently teaching a class at Princeton on uh, Latinx musicals on stage and screen. And so this is roughly running concurrent with the class I'm teaching right now. But uh, it also highlights the ways in which uh, musical performance has been a central piece of the way that Latino performers have been introduced to uh, broader American audiences. And so, um, so, I, so and I think it's always hard to sort of think about what the uh, contemporary vision of Latinidad or Latinness on in a mainstream US stage, it's always hard to have that conversation without the invocation of one of the figures in this extraordinary film, which we, and I would say that, I mean, it's a remarkable film. It's a, it's a fascinating film, but it is also extraordinary in that like there's not a lot of films quite like it. Uh, the gang's all here. Uh, one of the figures, one of the notable figures in that film, uh, in the sort of the hodgepodge of beloved character actors, of beloved uh, screen presences, is uh, Carmen Miranda. And so part of what I wanted to use the gangs all here in tandem with perhaps other Carmen Miranda films that you might have had access to or chosen to explore like Down Argentine Way or Weekend at Havana or other Four Jills in a Jeep. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Carmen Miranda's explosive rise to stardom in, the Hollywood, in Hollywood in the early 1940s. And to sort of open up the question that Carmen Miranda always poses, which is the question of what is, why, why was she so, um, did, she, did she have such a blazingly popular film career during this particular period? And why has her presence and costume and style been so enduring? Just the other day when um, I was meeting with my students, all of whom, as you might imagine, are pretty current Princeton students uh, in their like later teens or very early 20s, I asked them, had they ever encountered Carmen Miranda before? this weekend, before the weekend I had assigned them to watch the gangs all here in tandem with other Carmen Miranda films. And of the dozen or so students in the class, only one or two had actually heard or encountered Carmen Miranda specifically prior to this assignment. All of them had encountered the idea of Carmen Miranda, whether that would be through the Chiquita Banana logo and, and, and song, or through the idea of the costume of the lady with the tutti frutti hat, this you know this idea of putting on the costume, um, the idea of the uh, stock character of the sexually, the sexually exuberant malapropism prone Latina clown. These all were elements that the vest, the reverberations of Carmen Miranda were quite legible to my students, even if they didn't know that what they were seeing prior. To, like even though they hadn't necessarily made the connection to her name. So that's indeed another piece of why Carmen Miranda is, um, is always of interest to me. And I think the gang's all here, uh, I'll say is the final way to open up to questions and conversation because I'm sure there are thoughts on one thing about this film. There are things to think about as a result of this film and mysterious questions that may or may never be answered. Um, but one of the things about it is, is it, it is an emblematic Carmen Miranda film. Uh, it's, uh, and in some ways, it, uh, the ways in which her function in the story works is very much how she was utilized as a star presence in the period. Um, but it also is an extraordinary, it offers one of the most iconic sequences of Carmen Miranda's filmography which is uh, the middle, the, the lady in the tutti frutti hat, the sequence with the big bananas. Um, and this, that sequence, that iconic extended musical 
musical interlude, uh, both is emblematic of Carmen Miranda's cinematic legacy and impact, and also emblematic of Busby Berkeley as a, as a filmmaker. And this was uh, an important film in the Busby Berkeley oeuvre in terms of his first film in Technicolor, his first film uh, when he had moved to Fox, and, um, and, so, You're and going outside. <laughs> An important, uh, an important film, uh, in inter and uh, in an interesting way. As incoherent as the story is, as sort of random and wild as it is, the visual logics of it are also, I think, uh, really interesting in the way that it uses musical numbers in a whole range of ways. But in like the the ways the musical numbers fit, fit into the story, they join the story in all kinds of different ways, but they all end up operating in a way that I think is very interesting and worth considering. So both in terms of thinking about film, in terms of thinking about musical film, and thinking about why Latino bodies, Latino music, and Latino characters and presences are often so conjoined with musical, musical cinematic performance are all some of the things that are the reason I selected it to begin this conversation over the next, over the next four films about what about uh, Latin numbers, these sort of spectacular depictions of Latinidad often using music, dance, and elaborate, elaborate costume. So, um, so that's just by way of introduction. I'd be interested to hear questions and to begin the conversation. We'll be talking for the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes or so, depending on how the energy rolls. And um, once again, I would, uh, it helps my, it helps me a lot when your microphone does remain on mute until we're in the point when you're having the conversation with me and the rest of the group. So, um, uh, so uh, I guess what um, I'm switching my view to speaker view so that when you speak, you will pop up big and bold on the screen. So if you, anybody has a question or a comment you'd like to kick us into gear on, um, now's the time. I'll, I'll make a comment. Um, I'd never seen this film before and I don't actually remember if I have ever see, watched a Carmen Miranda movie from start to finish. Uh, I was kind of blown away by it and I think the thing that struck me right from the opening is the way that the musical numbers and the, it's like a fantasy element which, you know, you kind of have this, this Busby Berkeley kind of larger than life fantasy landscape that then pulls back to a much more constrained space of the actual stage in the nightclub. Um, and the, the bit at the, the final musical number at the end with the, you know, kaleidoscope and the floating heads and everything, I was thinking, this is psychedelia. It was wild. And I just can't imagine um, how this would have felt to audiences in 1943 with all the sort of war propaganda and everything else that was tied up in it. Um, yeah, so I, I just had an experience watching this film. Yeah, no, and I think that one of the things that's really important to acknowledge about this and, and another film that we might have started with is uh, that I was tempted to start with, but I wanted to think about Carmen Miranda. Another parallel film that I might have offered featured her sister, Aurora Miranda, uh, the Walt Disney film Three Caballeros. And which is also quite psychedelic. If you've watched it recently, if you've seen it, there's a number of sequences that are just really sort of eye popping, sort of dazzling and kind of a, almost a Fantasia style of just this sort of broad sort of use colors and other things. And the thing with both of them, both of the films that sometimes is hard to, uh, hard for us uh, as 21st cent denizens of the 21st century to remember is that these were films that were largely understood as being addressing as sort of a, a younger adult audience, sort of a dating audience, audience. And so it was, these were films, both Three Caballeros and Gangs All Here were really targeting um, uh, folks that were going to have a good time and watch some musical numbers and to have a sort of a, a frame of that that would be a fairly simple story with some comedic episodes, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think one of the things that uh, Janine Basinger talks about in her book, the recent book that she wrote called The Movie Musical, one of the things that she reminds us of in that book is the way that Busby Berkeley um, had come out of a, was in a sort of a period of transition in the early 1940s um, but the films that he became most famous for were these dazzling psychedelic sort of really eye-popping sequences, fantasies often sort of that were blasts out of utterly banal narratives that didn't really inspire a lot of interest, but these blasts of fantasy out of that. And what Basinger notes is that uh, 
Busby Berkeley became famous for black giving fantasy release from the depression. And then she points to the gangs all here as being a way that that same technique was able to give a fantasy release from wartime. And so it was anchored enough in wartime, like we do have the patriotic thing of the, of the, benefit, uh, the benefit concert on the sort of the, the backyard stage, like what a backyard stage that was, right? Um, the backyard stage, uh, but that was a war bonds performance. Also we see in the opening moment, before we even know what really the, the reality of the scene and the way that musical numbers will operate, the scene jumps in uh, right in with a musical number that looks really stagey. Right. So on the one hand, we're looking, is this just like Hollywood sets looking stagey? And then we just get a little bit as we as this musical number goes along, we begin to realize, oh, it's a stage set within the film. And so there's this way in which we're always set up to sort of know that the musical number is not real, is always just at the edge, but immediately adjacent to the story. And one of my favorite things about the film is uh, most filmmakers would feel like we needed to conclude. Um, and indeed, many Carmen Miranda films uh, do conclude with what is often a boilerplate Hollywood, uh, Hollywood finish with the two couples standing next to each other, sort of dancing toward the camera. You know, it's often a, a, a sort of a cliche of the way that Hollywood musical numbers finish, is you have the A, a romantic, like the A plot romantic couple and then the B plot romantic couple standing next to each other, dancing happily. And here, Busby Berkeley could really give a crank about the romantic resolution. We don't even get the moment when the, when the love interest actually and the, and the lover actually come together to kiss. We just get this moment when Edie realizes that the, the previously betrothed is like, I'm ditching, I'm taking, pursuing a, a career on the stage. And there's never a moment of reconciliation. Instead, we go into polka dot land with all those weird dancing children. And then we go into the real point of the finale, which is the floating heads and the neon hula hoops and all of that stuff, which allows us to blast out of the banality of marriage or the banality of making things work and into the utter delight and thrill of fantasy. And I think that that is one of the interesting tensions of when we look at Hollywood musicals from this period of how they often defy our expectations in, of, of what comes post Rodgers and Hammerstein, post Oklahoma, this idea that the musical numbers need to have a plot need to even be serving the plot and Busby Berkeley is completely uh in this film at least almost uninterested in plot except for the way it sort of gives a thread to string these other otherwise unrelated musical numbers together but again the musical numbers take a variety of different styles like Alice Bay and Carmen Miranda at this point were almost a package deal in a lot of Fox musicals and uh the contrast of their musical styles were quite appealing to audiences so it was a um, and indeed, the, this was a, uh, I, I love the way that, uh, at first, it looks like Carmen Miranda doesn't matter to the story at all, but then it's, it's one of those great, uh, it is a sequence where we do get a chance to see how, how she does matter to the story. So other, thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, prompt. And then uh, other thoughts or questions or things I always like to say to my students, what were your aha moments or what were your, in, in the use of their vernacular, your WTF moments or the moments that made you go, what? The moments that caused, caused you up short and saying, what the heck was up with that? Uh, so if you have anything you'd like to float in terms of why, did, why was that there or can you, or a favorite I, moment you want to I'll, reflect on? Go ahead. I see, a, I see a raged hand, but I think Rich Singer wanted to comment first. Great, thank you. Yes. We were just reflecting on um, Wizard of Oz and all the fantasy that was in there and the use of the little munchkins and, and their dancing and how also it gave people, you know, a sense of being out of themselves and any hardship mm -hmm. going on and so on. And I saw it when I was four years old. I was born in 43, so that was like 1947. I didn't realize it came out so much earlier. Uh, and of course, the same time when that came out, Gone with the Wind came out, and you brought up what the same yeah, the same director the same director, and again that was a fantasy with the colors mm -hmm. and all, though it wasn't a musical, and the types of things that appealed to people at the time, and then you think about West Side Story and O M G, you know what. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it's amazing what, what 20 years can mean, you know, in terms of 
moving from uh, like sort of 1940 to 1960. Um, and I think one of the things that's important to acknowledge about the way that a film like West, a film like um, Wizard of Oz, for example, which happens four years prior to The Gang's All Here, um, it was coming out, uh, Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind both came out of MGM. MGM was the studio that was in some ways the big studio on the block, the one that was known for the known for really epic productions and the, the great musicals of the period. Uh, Fox, 20th Century Fox, the producer of this film, was always a little bit scrappier, was a little bit less on the high, less expensive, less um, uh, less uh, prestige oriented in some ways. Like MGM was sort of aiming for, like especially when we go out of the period from 39 in, uh, is aiming for a measure of prestige. And I think what we can see is that it really, uh, MGM rehearses a lot of the core, what we would call conventions or expectations for musical performance, for musical film performance in the way that the Munchkins, uh, we know why they're there. We know why they're in the story. What's interesting about the polka dot children at the end of the gang's all here is there's no real clear sense why they're there. Like what is going on? And so it's, um, it's, there's no diegetic or narrative connection to why this scene matters to the film. And that's one of the things I think that Fox, Fox musical numbers, Fox musical films often didn't have as much concern about the conventions of, of coherence. Uh, for lack of a better term, you know, and it's and that's where they often contain some of the more uh, thrilling delights. Like I always love it when musicals of this period include a novelty number, as this one did, with that episode with the extraordinarily flexible young woman who was doing the sort of the um, the rotating black backflips. You know, we don't know who she is. She is not a character in the show. There's nothing that goes on, but it's this. It's this extraordinary visual spectacle of physical dexterity that is what we would call on a vaudeville stage a novelty number or a novelty act. And so there's a way in which the uh, pleasures of this film replicates uh, what for some audiences likely what they might see in uh, have seen 10 years prior in vaudeville or maybe even at the same moment in burlesque of this kind of a sort of mix of variety entertainments, this mix of low comedy, uh, and then sort of a visual spectacles featuring uh, very attractive women uh, in, arrayed as objects in the style of Ziegfeld or of Busby Berkeley here. And so there is a kind of way where I think that when we look at even a film like uh, Wizard of Oz, which was a middle, middle of the road critical, su critical success box office, it became a phenomenon as the years went along. Um, but, uh, Busby, but, the, but the Fox films, we're aiming for a different kind of entertainment value, not necessarily for respectability or prestige or critical acclaim. Uh, this film did receive some good critical notices, mostly in recognition of Busby Berkeley's achievements um, and of bringing together a, 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 a splendid uh, visual entertainment to the, to the screen. So it's, an, it's always interesting to see, like I think with Carmen Miranda movies, none of them are really canonical. None of them are canonical the way The Wizard of Oz or West Side Story are in terms of classics that are returned to that are often re-aired. Um, and uh, it's always a struggle for me of which is my favorite. Like I have a couple favorite Carmen Miranda movies, but The Gang's All Here is one that's uh, just enough of an iconoclastic entry into her catalog. And it also includes that legendary number of Tutti Frutti Hat that I think is just always worth knowing about and seeing uh, even though it exists as a music video might where we can watch that episode, that sequence and not need to know the rest of the story because it is a visually spectacular sequence of a song. Um, it's still always interesting to see it in context. But I think always asking, one of the things about popular performance is asking how it connects to other things, what it reminds you of, what is similar to and different from. And I do think if we think about um, Munchkin Land and, and Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead, and see how the Munchkins, which were a mix of, of uh, little folks, uh, little people, and children. Here we have, as best as I could tell, it was an all children cast, which of course goes to that other question of there's a, something always fascinating when children perform. There's something always fascinating when animals perform. So it goes to that element of a kind of uh, spectacle of a kind of entertainment. So, so, um, but yeah, I mean, the polka dot children are still the part that every time it comes along, I go, oh yeah, the darn polka dot children. 
Alice Faye's, one of the Alice Faye's best costumes in the, in the whole number. And it's surrounded by these weirdly elaborate, like these children with really elaborate expression as the polka dot children. So, so yep, uh, gang's all here. Makes no sense, but that's why it's awesome. So. I have, I have a comment, yeah. if, if I may, okay. along the lines of, of associations that are, that are brought up. Um, I loved this, the musical aspects of it in that it was mostly completely organic. You know, it was either in the nightclub or in the, the place where the soldiers got together or whatever. I, I love the appearance of, um, of Benny Goodman. Um, charismatic, maybe not so much, but what a musician. Uh, but what, what the thing that made me laugh the most, and maybe I'm weird, is when they're on the ferry and Alice Faye is about to go into her number, and then he says, "Where's that music coming from?" As if, you know, all of a sudden, you know, let's let's try for a little reality here. It, it really it made me laugh, and it it reminded me of of there's a gag in one of the Mel Brooks movies where music wells up, and you, you think, "Where's that music coming from?" And there's like a bus or something with musicians driving by. So that was one of the little. Well and they play that in an interesting way. And uh, she asked him to imagine the music and then it's like, and then he jokes, where's that music coming from? So it is this meta moment where yeah. it's both justified and undercut in, in a sequence of dialogue, right? So she says, like she, he convinces her to sing. And then she says, yes, okay, so we imagine the orchestra now. Right. And then he says, where's that orchestra coming from? So on the one hand, it's, it's the filmmakers are playing it both ways. They justify exactly. the fact that they are realistically on the ferry in front of the least realistic ferry backdrop we've ever seen. Um, they, they justify the realism and the diegetic logic of the moment that this is, these are not characters singing because they have so, like in a, in a Broadway musical style, where they're singing because they have so much feeling that needs to be expressed by song and dance. These are all like sort of loosely justified, even though once we get into the musical number, they leave that reality altogether, almost all of them. You know, I think that great example is of the Alice Faye number where she's in the domestic scene and it's supposed to be the scene in the next number show that they're working on. And there's this moment where she's on sort of a rickety set in the nightclub and da 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 da. But the second the musical number goes, the nightclub disappears and the music and the song and the emotions of the song and Alice Faye's incredible capacity to be about to, to, to have her tears well up. So she's about to cry, but never drops a tear, that art that she has, it was, it's on full display. And so her gifts as a, as a alto torch singer, sort of singing songs of deep feeling gets huge in that moment even though the moment, whether it be on the ferry or on the stage, is justified by the fact that she's a professional singer singing for, that's what she does for a living. And it's an interesting way where they play that. And it's often, um, one of the things about musical films that is sort of confounding is how do they justify it? And then like the sense that musical films need justification, like we need to know why they burst out in the song. And we'll see as the film goes along, as the series goes along, that there's different ways that that gets justified. Um, and, uh, but I also think that, that what, what I'm always interested in is not so much how it gets justified, but where, once the music begins, where the filmmaker takes us. Like, how does the, how does the music become a launching pad? And I do think that this becomes, like, there is very little that's emotionally engaging about the story of this film. But, there's a lot of emotion that act, gets activated of different colors, different textures in the musical numbers. And that's again, a, a, realize, a, a way to look at this film is it's asking us to sort of le let the music take us to emotional places. And not asking us to identify with characters or whatever, but just to ride with the music and see where the music will take us. And that is very much, I think, um, the, the way that when we look at this as a, as a series of extraordinarily mu extraordinary musical set pieces strung together by a mildly comedic plot line, um, then it makes a different kind of sense. And we're looking for a satisfying story that has a resolution because it doesn't really, all the knots get tied up, but it's not about the story. It's about the diversion that the musical numbers allow us. Thank you so much for all of this, Professor. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was not at all compelled by the non-musical bits 
right? And I was wondering if it's because I'm watching with a lens of what's the Latin American identity in this film, or if it's just they're uninteresting. And I think it's probably a combination, but um, you've sort of validated that they're also uninteresting. Um, well, yeah, well, and I think they depend on your, your interest in the performer, because many of right. the actors who are playing those parts, not all of them, but many of them are beloved screen presences. So it is like, oh, look, there's my favorite, Charlotte. You know, like there, there's, the, there's the kind of familiarity of watching a guest appearance on a bad television show that is sort of the pleasure in some of the secondary characters. But you were about to say. So I have two uh, questions. The first is if you could speak a bit to the relationship between the US and Latin American countries yep. at the time, because um, there's a lot to unpack in the first number, but there's that really small comment about the good neighbor policy, you know, being able to retire now. And it seems like they're trying to show the Latin America as our friend. Maybe that's because markets in Europe are kind of off or closed at this point due to the war. And then the second one is just why, why the fruit? <laughs> why the hat? Why did it stick all these years? Um, okay, well, that's a good, I think the good question is, that's, that's a, lot, a lot of good questions in there. Um, well, to, first off, I will say that um, I do think that one of the things that's really interesting to me is the way, uh, is the way the film, possibly through Busby Berkeley's craftsmanship, just sort of really activates all of the narratives of the good neighbor policy in the opening sequence without actually having to talk about it really at all. Um, because what we see is we see a ship arriving and we see a, a delivery of coffee and a delivery of sugar and then a delivery of fruit, which ends up being also a delivery of Karma Miranda, right? So it's this kind of way in which it activates that awareness, which by 1943 was a fairly active awareness of this idea of good neighbor policy. Um, the good neighbor policy, just as by way of brief context, was a policy that was never a policy. It was a rhetorical umbrella that contained a variety of different cultural imperatives, uh, began by FDR in his first inaugural address. And the only thing he said about domestic, po about international relations in his first domestic uh, inaugural address in 1933 was affirming a rising idea among US policy circles of sort of saying that the US was going to be a good neighbor um, and was going to sort of encourage neighborly relations throughout the hemisphere. This was part of a broader awareness among US policy that there was a kind of um, a wanting to assert a kind of hemispheric dominance by the United States to say that, okay, Europe, okay, England, you don't really have to have a military presence over here. We'll take care of this hemisphere. You can sort of respect us and, and then when it really gets going is in the later 1930s, when uh, it becomes uh, sort of more uh, based on military existence, ex uh, you know, in 1939, when uh, a war is actually erupting in Europe, Hitler advanced Poland, all those kind of things, the U.S. really does begin to step up and activate what had been ongoing for the previous six years, which was a campaign of soft diplomacy, utilizing things like cultural exchange and economic and economic investment as a way of sort of fortifying international relationships without actually using uh, a sort of polit like actually requiring treaties or re requiring governmental governmental participation. And one of those things was actually cultivating uh, sort of fruit, um, uh, fruit import, uh, sort of building certain uh, crops like sugar, like bananas, like these kinds of uh, cultivating business relationships in foreign countries as a mechanism of policy, and then also encouraging a variety of cultural initiatives, cultural exchanges, introducing the idea of Pan-Americanism, sort of a uni uniting across the, United, across the Americas. In 1939 and 1940, um, well, in the first film that is really sort of acknowledged as the first launch of this idea of Pan-Americanism and the introduction of good neighbor policy, good neighbor uh, aesthetics, is a film from 1933 starring Dolores Del Rio, starring Flying Down to Rio. Uh, 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 called Flying Down to Rio. And uh, it was produced by Nelson Rockefeller. And in 1939 to 1940, Nelson Rockefeller ends up becoming a uh, head of a key diplomatic area of the US government. With, and, and he sort of leads to saying the cheapest way for us to have the maximum propagandist impulse and impact in, in throughout the Americas is to sort of fortify cultural exchange. Let's make movies. Let's send, let's do cultural exchanges between orchestras. Let's do all this stuff to build, to use culture as a vehicle of exchange and a vehicle of, and so it led to this idea that the good neighbor policy is uh, what is patriotic, is we are friends with all the other American republics. 
And so that was, but that ended up leading to this core idea of the U.S. as the, the uh, like the U.S. was America and the, everything else was the Americas, the other American republics. So there was this sort of an idea of a U.S. dominance, but that was a big part of Carmen Miranda. Like the very first uh, movie, like she had her premiere in 1939 in New York City, uh, and that sort of led immediately to her being snatched up by Hollywood and down Argentine Way. She opens the movie with this musical South American Way, the musical number South American Way. And interestingly enough, her style, which was a new style for her in her nightclub costume in 1939, which was her adaptation of the Bahia costume, which is the head wrap and the sort of the, the, the the sort of mid exposed midriff, all those things. That was a sort of the costume for the act that got her noticed by Schubert in New York. And it ended up being what then ended up elaborating as she was a designer of most of her own costumes. She had experience in fashion and as a milliner. And somewhere along the way, the idea of her wearing, uh, putting things in her hat, like what we'll see in most of her costumes is she doesn't have fruit in her head, in her hat. She mostly has like big pom-poms or balls or these elaborate headdresses, right? Um, but in the idea of the Tutti Frutti hat, it stuck. And then Chiquita Banana, uh, which was United Fruit, one of the co corporations that was really invested in, um, in sort of building uh, banana production in certain countries like Costa Rica and Honduras, uh, they were, uh, they ended up sort of modeling this song Chiquita Banana in 1943 as well, which was promoting the use of bananas. And they adopted, they created a cartoon character that was a character that was very much like Carmen Miranda and who had fruit in her hair. And so it was this combination of the success of the lady in the Tutti Frutti hat, the lady carrying fruit on her head in tandem with this marketing of, of uh, Chiquita Banana that led to this sort of the permanent fusion of Karma Miranda as the lady with the fruit on her head, even though when you actually look at the number of costumes, she often had elaborate headdresses, but they very rarely actually had fruit, except for in this number where strawberries and bananas are her costume. So it's an interesting moment of this indelible, unforgettable set of images of her being like the size of a banana. Uh, uh, that sort of ends up being, a, and the idea of the lady in the tutti frutti hat, these kind of things all coming together that then end up also conjoining, even though she got, she had no profit participation, she was never a paid spokesperson for Chiquita Banana, but they adopted the idea of her as a, as a character and a logo, and that is, uh, remains their logo to this day. So in some ways, the idea of Carmen Miranda with fruit in her head has been an idea that was invented by this film in tandem with Chiquita and Banana. And in some ways, uh, to come up with how many she actually wears fruit in her head is comparatively small. But as we might, like there's a great sequence in the Woody Allen film Radio Days where one of his cousins who he lives with is really into Carmen Miranda and she's wearing fruit earrings, she's putting fruit in her hair. You know, so Carmen Miranda actually did inspire some style uh, some style innovations in terms of her heel, the way her shoes were, um, her wraps on her her uh, halter wraps, as well as her head wraps, and then also some of her chunky jewelry. A lot of which ended up using uh, fruit, uh, and they were cheap costume kind of jewelry. But it was young women that liked that style. So it's this fascinating confluence. And she spent the rest of her career uh, figuring out how to manage it because it was. It was the accident of timing that then she got stuck with it for the rest of her career. And indeed her memory carries with it, carries it with us to this day. So that's a sort of a way of engaging, I think those two questions, but I think it covers a lot of the context around Carmen. So thanks for both of those. Hi, I have a question. Um, do you happen to know how uh, through interviews or that, that Carmen Miranda felt about how she was portrayed? Because she was portrayed as kind of a bumbling clown well, I mean, she saw that as a character. And I think when you see interviews with her, you realize how her ex her English is nowhere near as accented as okay. it is on camera. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, a crafted persona that she understood as a comedic device. And indeed, when you look at some of her some of her rat -a tat tat speaking sequences in her films, where she has this moment, where she, well, I'm not, I'm, I've watched so many Carmen Miranda movies over the last few days, they're all, I can't remember which, what Gangs All Here has, but there's some stuff that she has around the picture and stuff like this, where she should, or, or the extraordinary sequence in the study with Nort, with, with Edward Norton, uh, like 
is that right? Edward Horton, um, where she's kissing him and stuff like this. And the way that they play with her misunderstanding a word, and then she puts the word back and it creates this whole kind of who's on first kind of series of confusions. Um, and often because it's so fast and because she misunderstands or misspeaks that it leads to an escalation of confusion and comedy. And one of the things about that is when you look at it, you realize it's not accidental. She is very deft in her construction and her craft of this persona. She understands. And indeed, one of the things that I'm always fascinated by her, is she was not a comedic presence in Brazil for the nine years that she had a career prior to coming to the United States. It, when she came to the United States is when she became a comedic figure that became a really skilled comic actress. But just like other sort of sexually extreme Latina clowns like say Charo mm -hmm. or Sofia Vergara, who also use, like Charo's one of great jokes is please don't misconscrew me when I, when I say, you know, these kind of, they're also very deft in understanding how to amplify the accent for comedic effect and amplify the longstanding, and this goes back throughout Western comedy, the longstanding delight in malapropisms, the, the longstanding delight in having the wrong word used as a way of, amp and so one of the things about it, though, is I think you're a part of your question. So what I would like to say is that on the one hand, not only did Carmen Miranda have a strong voice in designing her own costumes and also creating this comedic performance, uh, I'm also fascinated, like one of the first parodies of of uh, Carmen Miranda was by Imogene Coca, who some of you might know is a sort of legendary t television comedian. Um, the same year that she premiered. And Carmen Miranda collaborated with Imogene Coca, sort of trained her, this is what I do, this is what I do. So when you make fun of me, make sure you make fun of me yeah. correctly. And she she also collaborated with Mickey Rooney on his much less, uh, his much more uh, sort of violent caricature of her. Um, but uh, so she was alert to its construction, just as she was alert to the construction of her own costumes. And she always, she yes. always sort of, uh, contributed to the fashion design at the first of the Fox years. And, uh, and as, she, as she was moving on and was performing more in nightclubs and those kind of things, a lot of her public appearances, she talks about her, she'll take off her headdress. She'll talk about how she built her headdress and then she'll take off her headdress to reveal um, blonde, a blonde mane. Like, so she'll, so, so it's a, there's an awareness of its constructedness, but there's also an awareness of its constraint. And I think the only way I'm aware of, I think what, when, you, when she talks about how she's perceived in America, she often speaks in terms of being not, um, they don't always know everything I'm doing or who I am. They think they know who I am, but then they don't know who I am. You know, they, they, she plays with that kind of like, they think they do, but they don't. But where she was pained was the way that her, um, in Brazil, the way that her success in America was um, not, uh, initially embraced as something to be proud of, that a variety of people had a variety of critiques of why she was successful. And that was very painful for her. And so when she returned to Brazil in the early 1940s at the height of her American fame, she confronted a lot of pretty disparaging critique from a variety of different angles mm -hmm. and actually never returned to Brazil until right before her death. And then, uh, and you know, and so didn't really reconcile that. But when she did die unexpectedly, tragically, um, in her appearance on the Jimmy Durante show in 19, uh, it, you know, when she was only 46 years old, um, when she returned to her, like it was a national day of mourning in Brazil, 60,000 people attended the funeral and then 500,000, more than 500,000 people joined the funeral procession through Rio de, through, through um, Buenos Aires. No, Rio de Janeiro, sorry. And um, so it was, so it's a complicated legacy and indeed, uh, because of the questions of racial appropriation that had with her adoption of the Bayi costume, like her legacy remains fraught in terms of what does she mean for Brazilians. But um, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for the complexity of her choice making and also the fact that she was not a dupe. She, it's easy to think of her that she was misused by Hollywood, which I think is correct. But she was, in, she was making active choices throughout the ways in which uh, and and I think she she struggled when she when her Hollywood when when her film career died and she but she was still very successful and quite in demand on the club circuit and was beginning to find a way into television when she died as a result of an unexpected heart attack in her middle forties. Hmm. Can I follow up on that just a little sure. bit, please? Um, I'm I'm a little I'm, I'm thinking about her character in this movie specifically, yeah. and if I were a Latina, I think I might be a little bit peeved. 
um, because even though behind the scenes, obviously she had a lot of agency and a lot of intellect and, and, and input and so forth, you know, she's, as the clown, I mean, she, she didn't even have a last name. Mm -hmm. She didn't. She didn't have any any like r romantic engagement with anybody. She was like the one single roaming around there. Um, I, I, I'm I'm just wondering how it was received at the time and how it's been sort of analyzed since. Well, I think that what I think that the characters are nothing characters, and I think it's uh, the characters that she plays are pretty much. There's not a lot of. Uh, dimension or texture to them. And uh, so I don't think when people have revisited them, they're impressed by the, the way the characters are scripted. And that's one of the things that I think is always really interesting to see is, are we interested in what is the character and the narrative scenario? Because there is, a, like, I think the most, one of the more emblematic uh, Carmen Miranda films in terms of Latinx representation would be Weekend in Havana when she actually does have a fairly elaborated character a character arc that is does have a love interest uh, who is also Cesar Romero and it's a key core parallel plot like it's fully there's a lot of stuff going on it's comp it's complicated in all these kind of ways uh, she's uh, she's got fewer redeeming features in it even though she's got more screen time so it's it's a uh, it's a question of the character uh, is uh, yeah so I, I don't know that there has been um, there was, there's ever been anybody who's claimed that these are positive representations of Latina characters. What we do see is often this the case is what happens is what is the dexterity and the charisma of a performer that is constrained by the scripts of the, of the time. So it's not so much looking for positive representation, but it's looking at seeing a performer make the most of it. Like one of the, one of the uh, paradoxes is of course too in Weekend in Havana, just like down Argentine Way, is you'll see a lot of non-Latinos playing Latino characters with thick accents opposite actual Latinos playing Latino characters with thick accents. So it's a question of the stylization of the characterization that was, that was sort of the shorthand of the period. And um, like down Argentine Way in which uh, Carmen Miranda literally has no role except as a nightclub singer. And then she, I guess she has to have one glancing encounter in a, in another context, but um, but there is a, uh, so I mean, it's not so much that there's character and granted, we don't know that, um, I don't know of anybody who's defended these as positive representations of Latinas. What we do see is fans at the time uh, uh, who, were Lat who we would today recognize as Latino or Hispanic or, or Brazilian or Portuguese um, were, uh, celebrating the fact that here there was somebody who uh, resonated, like they claimed her as one of theirs, even if it wasn't always a positive representation uh, in the context of the film. So it was mainstream visibility, even without, you know, so that's always the complexity. If when we're looking for positive representations, we're not going to find a lot. We're not going to find, we'll find a lot in 2020, let alone in 1943. So it's this question of what are the rewards to be seen? What are, when is talent allowed to be shown? And I'm not saying that she had input. I'm just saying that they relied upon her uh, to, and they built the show around what were her skill sets, just like Charlotte, Charlotte Greenwood, who does the big kicks and stuff like this. They built the roles around their strengths. And one of the things I always take as, uh, one of the things I love is that she and Alice Fay, who appeared opposite each other in a great number of films, were really stalwart friends. And Alice Fay became one of her most, Carmen Miranda's most uh, vigorous defenders of her in the, in the later year, uh, you know, in the subsequent years. Just talking about how, do not mistake the woman, the character you see on screen for the woman who made that character and underscoring that distinction, which is sometimes a very tricky thing to do. How do we do, how do we hold performers in the past responsible for uh, negative depictions or depictions that were allowed to sort of be the seed for a variety of subsequent ne negative depictions. Um, you know, do we blame Carmen Miranda for the many cruel imitators that came along and perpetrated Lat anti-Latinx stereotypes using the Tutti Frutti hat? Is that Carmen Miranda's fault? What is the culpability there? And then also the question of whitewashing and erasure of a, of a, of a multiracial Brazilian presence that she is a light-skinned woman born in Portugal, but raised in, raised in Brazil, working class, but still had light-skinned privilege and all of this kind of stuff. And she took a style 
that was a style that was mostly affiliated with underclass black women and then she made it into a concoction that was unrecognizable to its origins. What do we think about that in terms of racial appropriation? I think there's really rich conversations to be had, but I also think it's worth uh, always acknowledging um, the complexity of her own circumstance and the fact that she had a measure of artistry within the constraints of her moment. And, uh, and so, so yeah, so I, I would totally agree that it's a lot, it's, a, it's irksome uh, and it is a clown and there's all those limitations, but she's really skilled at it. She wouldn't have had the career that she had in the moment playing these parts had she not been skilled. And we, we can, what you can see in the different things is she gets, uh, her co-stars when they know how to play opposite her, she gets better. She's allowed to be better when some like, and that's where again we get in Havana and Springtime in the Rockies. There's some great, it's great set pieces in it, in each. So I always watch the films for Carmen Miranda, and then occasionally for Alice Bay. But then, and then maybe there'll be a sort of a twirly lady or something like this that comes along. But it's generally uh, not looking for positive representation. I'm looking for these extraordinary moments of flashes of what was her genius and what would she have been able to do if she had been allowed to step out of the role that people wanted to lock her into. Because that was, again, as I noted, it was just happened to be the act she was doing when she was discovered by Hollywood, by New York and Hollywood, and they never let her do a different act. I think we have There, time there was for... one, odd, can, uh, one odd thing that, I, I, that, ca that caught my attention. Uh, this relatively minor character was speaking Spanish for a, a, a fairly long period of time. I forget the, the exact scene. But it was, there was a lot of Spanish, and, and, the, and the response was, oh, he's speaking the language of the wolf, you know, like the, 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 you know, the predatory male or whatever it was. And I just thought, you know, in the, in the days before subtitles, there, there's a, a good, perhaps a, an example of where the foreign is made into something, uh, uh, you know, negative, that it's, it's scary for, the, for your average American who, who doesn't know uh, uh, Portuguese uh -huh. from Spanish, that that just, that caught my attention. Well, and it's an interesting, it's again, it's one of those ways in which the register of the moment and the register of now are both, the, are, are, are interesting because when Alice Faye makes that line, when she's talking about the, the, the ballroom dancer who's furious mm -hmm. that his partner cannot perform because she's got rose fever, right? And right. so he's furious and he's in that Latin fever, that way that mask, Latin men go and they go sort of like, whether it be him or Desi Arnaz, like when their feeling rises, out comes this sort of torrent of Spanish. And it wasn't especially deaf Spanish, it wasn't especially sort of clear Spanish. And when Alice Bay says he, because, and then he starts identifying, um, I forget the character's name at this moment, but the but the sort of the daughter of the family who is the betrothed of the, of the, of the other, of the, the central love interest, when he sort of sees her and says, oh, you're interesting and you can dance. And he starts going after her and begins sweet talking to her Spanish. That's what Alice Spey says, uh, oh, that's the language of the wolf, in which it's also, she is the dancer at the canteen who knows what it's like to have the predatory attentions of men. And so the wolf is a standard trope in this period. Um, even if you see cartoons of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf as a sort of a predatory man who's always looking to pounce on a woman. So on the one hand, it does evoke that bestiality of the Latin, uh, of Spanish and something more animalistic and all of that. But it also has a register in terms of contemporary slang which is asking, which is uh, sort of the, uh, oh, don't trust that, he's a wolf, he's pouncing. He's pouncing on, he's, he's a predatory male. And so she's calling him out in that way uh, for being a predatory male. But that dual register is of course, sort of like we were talking about, about the uh, sort of, imagine you hear the music, where's that music coming from? It's sort of playing it both ways, which is where we can always see uh, like, uh, you know, we, where we can see a lot in a lot of representations around race over the years, where there'd be a joke that is sort of vaguely racist and then they come in with an alibi right after it or right before it, they set it up and justify it. Like how do you have the pleasures of, of both sentiments? So it works on both registers, but I did want to underscore, like I noticed that line too, because I was like, oh, Alice Faye's calling him a wolf. She's naming that he's, that he's sort of erotically, he's an erotic predator at the same time that he's just had this sort of Latin animalistic sort of eruption. So uh, absolutely. So I think we have time for one last question.
Sure, Ms. Ross. Oh, you're um, you're still muted, Ms. Ross. Ms. Ross. Chris, oh yeah, great. There, no, you 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 were off, and then you were on. It, like, try it again, one more time. There we go. I just wanted to make a comment that the movie was out in '43. Yeah. And um, when we talk about sugar and coffee and fruit, we're talking about things which were rationed in the United yeah. States at that time. I don't think fruit was rationed, but sugar, coffee, and so on uh, were rationed. And um, I felt that the hat was just. Um, I mean, it was always an important uh, part of my upbringing because I remember in dancing school, we were all doing um, common Miranda routines in, in mm -hmm. the 40s, but we were also on ration lines uh, waiting, you know, with stamps and um, there was such a shortage and an awful feeling in the country. I was a very young kid, but it was a very tough time in America and um, that kind of abundance of the, of the hat, you know, that uh, overdoing it was, was, I felt it maybe in some ways a reaction to just the shortages that we were all feeling. So I think, I think you've named it exactly. And this is a great way to end is I do think that the opening of the film sort of indicates this idea of here's this huge load of coffee. Here's this huge load of sugar. And then these are these exotic fruits that previously just 10 or 20 years before had been delicacies, but are now actually affordable and, and nutritious. And so this is the space of survival and pleasure at the same time. And then also the musical numbers are designed, I do think that that crucial moment at the end of Tutti Frutti Hat, when we see the camera recede away and Carmen Miranda herself is standing in front of a painted backdrop and the fruit just goes on and on and on and on. Not only were the bananas enormous, but there's so many of them, right? And so there is the sense of that the musical numbers allow that space of relishing in the luxury, luxuriousness of fantasy and possibility, of seeing a a whole stage full of happily dancing children, of seeing a whole stage full that are sort of exempted from reality, just enough connection to reality where you can just, you know, disappear into the feeling of what it's like to hope your beloved is coming home from war as she does in that little sequence. Allowing those feelings to be big and to be beautiful as opposed to the sort of the stark realities of wartime, especially in this, at this peak in 1943. So I do think that this is when we look at the gangs all here and we look at any Carmen Miranda movie from this period, we can see all these paradoxes, we can see all these contradictions, but we can also see the ways in which Car like, uh, Carmen Miranda, Alice Bay, Betty Grable, uh, Cesar Romero, all of these other stars were performing alongside her we're activating a sense of pleasure and joy in deeply uncertain times. And the ways in which the cinema at this period was an essential space to sort of rally our sense of fortitude, which is why you very rarely see a film from this period that doesn't include something that gestures like war bonds or, or, um, or uh, gardening or recycling or doing these kinds of being part of the effort and of offering this complicated acknowledgement of the reality, but also being able to escape from it at the same time and that everyone deserved an escape. And that's in some ways what the movies provided. So I think, um, I think what I'm hoping that we'll be able to leave tonight with is to think about the complex um, and unexpected legacies and paradoxes that Carmen Miranda activates and also to be, keep an eye for. It doesn't take long before we'll see a call out to Carmen Miranda for watching popular culture today, even still. Something that we can say that that has a connection to Carmen Miranda. So I would encourage you as you look around, see how many times you brush up against the memory or the scent or the reflection of Carmen Miranda in the cultures in which we participate, whether that be at the grocery store, on the television channel, on the internet, you know, like these kinds of things are, it's part of the texture of, of American popular culture. When we come back in three weeks, if you join me, we'll be looking at a very different film, which is West Side Story, which has a very different history, a very different genesis, a very different moment in historical, in, in, in history, but it, uh, also it has its, its roots in a Broadway musical, which is very different than what Gangs All Here does. Um, and it's the only musical that we'll be looking at that actually has that structure to it that is a successful canonical Broadway musical that becomes an even more canonical film. And to look at the questions of adaptation, but also the questions of really sort of the, the questions that we talked about a little bit tonight about representations of what Latino-ness or Latino identity is and the way that West Side Story becomes a really crucial reference point 
for a lot of subsequent depictions of Latinos in film and television and theater uh, for both its good and its bad. But again, uh, the ways in which her performer like Rita Moreno both is celebrated for her inhabitation of a role, but also the way she exceeds the role, that some of what we take from certain performances is beyond what is scripted within them. So, um, so if you join me again, we'll talk about West Side Story. And if you know me at all, you know I can talk and I, I, you know, all roads return to West Side Story for me. So I'm always thrilled to visit. And I will look forward to seeing some of you come back then and bring your friends. I think tickets are still available. And I'll let Chris do a sign off if he has anything he needs to add. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Herrera. This was really wonderful. And I look forward to our next conversation. I did want to just thank all of our members for joining us. Um, did you have something else you wanted to add? No. No, uh, thank you for, to all of our members for joining us and for your support. And I look forward to seeing you all back here in three weeks. Thank you very much. Have a good night.